Hi, everyone. See folks trickling in. Give us a couple more seconds before we, we start. Hello all, um, and welcome to the second installment of our four-part series on public humanities in higher education. Thanks very much for joining us. I'm Michelle May Curry, Project Director for Humanities for All, which with the generous support from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, advocates for and supports publicly engaged humanities scholarship on campuses and in communities. Today, I'm very pleased to be joined by three higher ed faculty and administrators who each lead initiatives aimed to support faculty and graduate students in creating engaged courses. Jessica Berman is the director of the Drescher Center for the Humanities and professor of English at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Dean Albritton is the director of the Center for Arts and Humanities and associate professor of Spanish at Colby College. And Joe Sayadella is the senior program lead for public scholarship and co-facilitator of the Engage Pedagogy Initiative at the University of Michigan. Note that you can view recordings of earlier events in this series on our YouTube channel, which you can access through the event page link just shared in the chat. Today, the focus of our conversation will be on supporting humanities faculty in creating engaged courses. Calls for publicly engaged humanities courses that center community partnership and project-based learning are increasing across college and university campuses. Undergraduate and graduate students are seeking training that puts the critical thinking and storytelling methodologies of the humanities towards public-facing works. These classes also importantly attract students to the humanities by connecting humanities disciplines to students' aspirations to address the challenges of our current moment. Faculty too are keen to answer the call for increased public engagement in the classroom and in many cases are leading the charge. Nonetheless, to develop these courses, faculty generally need time, funding, and the ability to develop mutually beneficial community partnerships. After hearing brief intros to each of the panelists' initiatives, we will spend some time in conversation about these topics and hope to generate some fruitful starting points for those in the audience who might hope to replicate elements from these initiatives on their campuses. Before we hear from our presenters, I'd like to take a moment to frame today's conversation in light of the work of Humanities for All and our recent efforts to support humanities scholars and administrators in higher ed in building a sustainable public humanities infrastructure on campuses. Specifically, we've been charting recent efforts to create degree granting public humanities departments as well as public humanities centers, labs, institutes, and fellowships. We're especially interested in how the growth of this infrastructure is a part of a larger effort across higher ed to make connections between the public humanities and ongoing social justice and civic engagement work happening in communities. To better understand and advocate for the continued growth of this infrastructure, we have launched a major survey effort that aims to collect publicly engaged humanities projects and learn more about the campus-based infrastructure that supports them. Based on results from the survey, we plan to publish a major resource on public humanities campus infrastructure. If you're interested in contributing efforts on your campus, please follow the link in the chat to participate in the survey. We're excited to have three leaders with us today who have built a public humanities infrastructure on their campuses, particularly one that supports faculty in developing and sustaining engaged courses. A quick note on format for today's webinar, we plan to have plenty of time for discussion and questions from the audience following our conversation. Please submit questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And we'll be sharing links through the chat, but please be sure to submit your questions via Q&A rather than the chat so they don't get lost. Um, and we'll try to field as many of your questions for the entire, entire panel as possible. Um, but with that, let's let's begin. Um, hello, all. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, if we could start by having each of you describe your initiatives for the audience, um, including its scope and mission and any um, outcomes you'd like to share to date. Um, Jessica, how about we start with you? Hi, I'm glad to be here. Just give me a second so I can share my screen. Um, host disabled participant screen sharing. Sorry, I need to be um, allowed to share my screen. Uh, 
Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Looks like it's working. Um, okay, can you all see? Can somebody give me a thumbs up? All right, I'm Jessica Berman, as you said, director of the Dresher Center for the Humanities at UMBC, and really glad to be here to talk about how we support faculty in creating engaged courses. Um, so the first thing I just want to say off the, 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 at the start is that supporting public humanities does not have to be expensive or a major departure from your usual programming, whatever that may be. Um, if you build it into your mission and you constantly look for ways to move it forward, you can seed the ground for future work. We found that by supporting faculty in small ways, setting up working groups, hosting workshops, offering small grants, um, the faculty will then move forward towards larger projects. And over the five or six years we've been really focused on this, We've had a really big in increase in the number of faculty interested in engaged teaching and then the number of courses being offered. Um, so as you see here, the Dresher Center sees a core part of its mission to support and promote the humanities in its public and community engaged dimensions. Um, you see two aspects of our missions highlighted here, but I particularly want to point to the last one. We build partnerships that engage communities in addressing issues of equity, inclusion, and justice. Um, working in and with communities is crucial to our work. And I think it's important to be clear about that whenever we represent the center, not just when we're specifically talking about public engagement. Um, and showcasing public humanities is also important in other ways because it shows what we all know, um, public humanities work is exciting and engaging for students and it can help you bring majors into your department, students into your classes. It also helps uh, something else that's very important to all of us in higher ed. Um, it helps administrators, members of the public, and potentially alumni also see the power of the humanities outside the academy. And so we've really worked um, hard and slowly but surely built recognition of this work on campus. This is cheap to do, but it has a really big payoff. Um, um, so uh, I, excuse me, I went too fast. So I wanna highlight some of our public humanities initiatives. I co-chaired a working group that created our public humanities minor. Um, and here you see um, students from that minor did a project just this past fall, uh, documenting Latino immigration history and food culture in Baltimore. And the Baltimore Sun just recently did a really nice article on them, which was very cool and to have that recognition. Um, work on campus developing the minor also led to the development of a major project called the Baltimore Field School, which is supported by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Um, and the Field School offered workshops for faculty to build capacity for collaborative public humanities projects. And this was re uh, run by my amazing colleague, Dr. Nicole King, Chair of American Studies. Um, but just to step back, we have a major initiative we developed a few years ago called the Inclusion Imperative. And we developed this in partnership with Coppin State University, Bowie State University, and Howard University. Um, this is also supported by the Mellon Foundation. There are three programs in the Inclusion Imperative, but we're highlighting here um, the Humanities Teaching Labs. Um, but I also want to stop again. You don't need a, a big grant from Mellon to run the Humanities Teaching Labs. The budget for this part of, of our project is really very small, and we could be doing this even without a major grant. So um, I just want to emphasize that. Um, so the Humanities Teaching Labs present hands-on workshops that um, help faculty develop inclusive and community-engaged courses or projects. Um, and here are just a couple of examples of the great workshops we've offered. Um, in particular, at the bottom, you see Dr. Nicole King um, offered an interviewing workshop for faculty who wanted to have their students out interviewing. So that's just one example among many. Um, the Humanities Teaching Labs also offer course transformation grants, and these are $4,000 grants to faculty to develop a new course or to transform a project for a course and they get $500 if they repeat the course. 
um, and here a couple of examples, um, but I want to just highlight telling our counter stories, which was a collaboration between the Writing Center director at UMBC and the Writing Center director at Baltimore City College High School to get their cohorts of students together to talk about the power of counter narrative to, uh, to address forms of oppression. The inclusion imperative also has developed a diversity teaching network, and that is among UMBC whoop, and uh, HBCUs in the area, and it's focused on developing a community practice around inclusive and engaged teaching, and our annual symposium always highlights incredible examples of engaged teaching. Um, you see the various past symposia this year, UMBC is going to host one focused specifically on public humanities. Um, and I just wanna end with um, an example of a scholar we've supported. She was a co-organizer of the symposium at her campus, Bowie State, uh, Professor Gina Lewis. Um, and at that symposium, she met a scholar from Howard University with whom she collaborated. Um, great outcome from the symposium, but then the next year she became a visiting faculty fellow on our campus um, and was able to work with our director of public history and the current acting director of the Treasure Center, Dr. Denise Maringolo, on this project that you see here um, on African American communities around the CNO Canal. Um, and both Denise and Gina are now using this project in their classrooms and involving students in their work, which we thought was just an amazing outcome, the kind of synergy we like to see. So I'll end it there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jessica. Dean. Uh, thanks again, Michelle, for having me. And um, some of what I'll talk about is, is kind of similar to some of what Jessica's initiatives are in the Drescher Center. Um, the Center for Arts and Humanities at Colby College was founded in 2012. Um, and what, what makes our center a little bit different is, I mean, we are uh, an institution without graduate students, um, but we're heavily undergraduate focused. Um, our student uh, students are sort of the focus of what we do, um, but we do have special initiatives for faculty um, and local arts and humanities organizations like the Waterville Public Library, the Opera House, local museums, etc. Um, one of our biggest programs is what we call our Humanities Labs program. Um, this offers hands-on experiential learning in the arts and humanities through uh, new course design or rewriting existing courses from our faculty in the arts and humanities and humanistic uh, uh, sciences. Um, so some examples of that, uh, this past semester, we had a really cool cooking class in Italian um, where students read excerpts of pastoral novels in Italian and reproduces the, reproduce the dishes that, that were made in those novels. We had a course called Mapping Waterville um, by Ben Lyle, a professor in American studies, uh, which, was, which performed geographical and architectural field work uh, to construct an online archive of Waterville, our city where we are, a town where we are, where Waterville's built environment. We also have had Maine's musical soundscapes um, where students studied ethnographic field notes and basic filmmaking to document the musical culture of Maine's ethnic and racial communities. And we've had other types of courses that work with Wikipedia, um, with arts archives uh, in the area in Maine and more. Um, and as you can see, the majority of these are, are pretty low or no cost um, involving just sort of software that could be free or uh, purchased at, at you know, not for not uh, terribly expensive. Um, though we do offer stipends, as Jessica said, we do offer stipends as well to our faculty that are developing these new courses um, as course development grants. Uh, and then we also in, in the center will provide sort of some additional resources for things like field trips or um, bringing speakers in and things like that. Um, so I think that this program um, has been pretty successful in changing the shape and tenor of our courses that we offer at Colby by offering faculty, uh, I don't want to say a more creative outlet, but a way to um, sort of expand uh, the types of things that they would already routinely teach, and also to serve as a node, I think, between some of those local arts institutions, 
um, that are already out there that we know of that they may not know of and put the kind of dynamic work that they're already doing in the classroom in contact with the Waterville Public Library, for example, which they may not know the types of things that it's doing or the Maine Humanities Council, for example, putting our faculty into contact with them as well. Um, so we, we see ourselves as very much a node uh, to, to kind of propel the work that our faculty are already doing. We also have, and, and I'll just mention this one briefly um, because it's, it's quite new, it's in its first year, a public humanistic inquiry lab uh, is the name of it, which is much more faculty oriented and research driven um, on the part of our faculty. Um, this is a three year program, uh, which basically allows for faculty to uh, gather around a central inquiry uh, that has a public facing element. And so the, the one that we're sponsoring this year with uh, the humanities division uh, is perspectives on the intersection of race and medicine. And so as I, as I believe we'll talk about later, you know, I think this is also one of the ways that we've seen our faculty react to the current environment and to be thinking more forwardly about how the public humanities can connect up to pressing social issues of our time. Um, so I'll just stop right there with those two, um, and I'm sure we'll have way more to talk about. Great, thank you so much, Dean. Um, and Joe. Thank you, Michelle, and, and thanks everyone for being here, and thanks for having me. I'm gonna drop a link in the chat really quickly just to the program that I'm gonna talk about its website so folks can learn more there if they wish, but um, I, as Michelle mentioned, manage the program in public scholarship at the Rackham Graduate School at, at the University of Michigan, um, which kind of broadly considers supports graduate students in a variety of ways, seeking to, to do community engaged work and, and public facing work, um, especially in an interdisciplinary kind of way. And, and one piece of that kind of um, one of our four core programs is the Engaged Pedagogy Initiative. Um, which was started in, in 2014 um, through an AACNU Bringing Theory to Practice grant that, that a faculty member here, Matthew Countryman, um, who some of you may know, applied for and, and received um, to kind of start the program and get it up and running. And now it's it's funded through a couple different sources of funding internally, plus, plus the staff time to facilitate it. Um, and it's a partnership between Rackham, the Graduate School at U of M, the Ginsburg Center for Community Service Learning, um, and our College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, which is our, our liberal arts kind of um, school on campus. And I think that points to, to one difference being at a larger kind of institution. There are these synergies and um, between units on campus that help support this work. Um, but this program is a little different and compared to the other two that you just heard about and that it supports graduate students. So it's really focused on training future faculty to to create community engaged um, courses in the humanities and, and beyond. It's, it's an interdisciplinary program and, and that's one of the, the things that students really gain from it and benefit from is, is that interdisciplinary conversation across fields in the humanities as well as across different schools and, and colleges at U of M too. Um, so the nuts and bolts of it, it's, it's basically an eight week seminar. It's not a course because it's not, not for credit on campus. It's, it's really kind of seen as a professional development workshop for graduate students, but, um, it's eight weeks. There are eight sessions, um, that go over various topics, you know, creating ethical, mutually beneficial partnerships to, you know, how do you structure a course that that's community engaged? Um, how do you, you know, do effective reflection in that course? Um, and basically walk students through the process of creating a community engaged learning course. And by the end of it, they have a syllabus that they can use when they're applying on the academic job market to positions. Um, there's an opportunity through the program and a partnership with the residential college on campus for students to apply to a course competition to teach their course on campus, um, which many of the students choose to, to apply to and, and then ultimately do. Um, and students also receive a, a $500 stipend for participating in the program. So there's a competitive application process. Um, and I facilitate many of the sessions along with my colleague, Nirja Aruvamadan, who's um, the, now the director actually of the Ginsburg Center at U of M. So really kind of creating, I wouldn't have capacity to do it all on my own. And so kind of these partnerships across campus really allow us to, to do this work and, and support graduate students. Um, what else was I gonna say about it quickly? Really, I think for the students builds a sense of community, the program really started because there was 
interest and, and demand among students for more training and how to, how to design effective kind of community engaged learning courses. And we often see that students, once they've participated in this, they first have an interest in teaching these courses and are better prepared for, for the job market and their future careers. And, and they also then participate in other public scholarship programs. Um, kind of some of the outcomes just really quickly. Um, since 2014, there have been about 100 or 141 graduate students who participated in the program. Um, there are cohorts every year. Um, it used to be twice a semester, now it's only once, or it used to be twice a year, now it's only once a year. Um, but the cohorts are about between um, 12 to 15 graduate students. Um, in terms of the, the courses um, that students have taught on campus through the program and that partnership I mentioned with the residential college, there have been 17 students who have taught those courses, um, and they've ranged in topics from the one that a student is teaching this semester is interfaith organizing. They've been on topics from climate change to um, um, classical archaeology, uh, working with local museums and K through 12 educators, um, disability justice. So again, to, to kind of Dean's point, engaging with kind of critically important topics of, of social concern that, that kind of use a humanities and liberal arts lens to, to look at those topics. Um, yeah, I think that's that's kind of where I can leave it for now. And then as we go into the discussion, happy to answer more questions and, and share more. Great. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. Um, so each of you, each of you are situated at very different institutions. Right? Colby is a, is a small liberal arts college. UMBC is sort of a mid-sized research university and Michigan is this massive R1. Um, how do you see the nature and infrastructure of your institution shaping the scope of the publicly engaged humanities scholarship and teaching on your campus? Um, what are some of the benefits um, and challenges to teaching engaged humanities courses that may be unique to your institution? Um, Dean, do you wanna tackle that question first? <laughs> sure. Um, I think maybe the most obvious is that our size and location at Colby is both a strength and a challenge. So uh, for those of you that don't know, we have about a uh, little over 2,500 students uh, and we're in essentially pretty rural central Maine. Um, and so, at a small slack like Colby, I think there's a lot of uh, freedom, academic freedom to sort of create your own courses. So um, I think that in a way is one of our strengths, right? The faculty are already encouraged and some ways expected to produce these kinds of dynamic engaged courses. Um, and I think our location also helps us uh, to forge deeper, maybe more connected and frequently utilized relationships between our faculty and our community partners. Um, but I think it also means that we, we sort of tap that well kind of quickly, right? We don't have the kind of limitless uh, potential for all sorts of new and emerging relationships uh, with community partners that other larger institutions or, or people in cities or institutions in cities might have. So when we're talking about who's local, um, we have an unlimited number of community partners in the arts and the humanities that are local. So well, you know, we can find ourselves thinking we have to look further afield, we can bring all sorts of challenges to say, well, how do we how do we connect with an arts institution in Portland, which is about 75 miles away, um, in the same way that we do with something that's really local in our town of 16,000. So I also think, uh, despite the freedom that we have to teach our courses, without graduate student or lecturer positions, faculty are often called on to teach those kind of like very key core courses. Um, so I think that can be a challenge. I also think it's really exciting and refreshing to see some of our faculty respond in really innovative ways. Um, the, the Italian course that I mentioned earlier is a really interesting way that a faculty said, well, I have to teach this course or have to, I get to teach this course uh, uh, where I'm teaching students Italian, but I'm also going to do this through the lens of food and in preparation of food, right, and sharing that bit of culture as well. Um, so I think that, that that maybe it's sort of the obvious answer, but that the size and location can be a, both a strength and a challenge for us. Um, I thought I'd just chime in on that question. Um, 
UMBC is actually in an unusual position. It's sort of uh, uh, positioned outside of the city, but close to the city. And so I think doing public humanities work has really helped the institution um, build its connections to especially Baltimore, but also the communities immediately surrounding the campus. Um, the, the campus was not always so interest in, interested in doing that work. And um, when it did become one of the priorities, we could step forward and say, hey, we have faculty already doing this. We have faculty who are already taking their students into Baltimore to interview or to create um, zines about certain neighborhoods. Um, and uh, you know, it, it was it was actually an opportunity for us to sort of step forward into the broader mission of the institution. So I think it's really uh, that's that's a really great thing that can happen if you do this um, if, if you have enough people engaged in this. Um, one of the things about UMBC is also that you know it's trying to balance research and teaching all the time. It prides itself on its undergraduate teaching, and yet it is a larger sort of mid-sized research institution, not a liberal arts college. And again, um, something about the public humanities teaching really bridges that divide nicely. Um, you can get faculty who are really excited, you know, uh, the, the Latinx um, food and immigration history course is part of a faculty member's work with um, uh, Latinx communities and foodways. And, um, uh, you know, she could bring that work to her students. And then all of a sudden, we've got this really exciting synergy going on. And it, it sort of makes it pop for the administration. So, um, uh, you know, that that's been a great thing. Yeah, I mean, I would echo what what my colleagues have said, but I think the size at U of M is a challenge in a different way. It's it's such a large institution that especially graduate students, I think, oftentimes have a hard time figuring out where to to connect to do public humanities work or publicly engaged work. Um, but once they do, the, the kind of benefit is that there are lots of resources to to support that. So when students who have gone through the, the EPI program um, are teaching their course at, at U of M, the Ginsburg Center, and myself can, you know, be really helpful partners in, in you know, helping build relationships with community-based organizations in the area, um, which there are, are a wealth of. Um, on the flip side of that, there's often so much happening at U of M that, that community partners can often feel like they're being asked to do things from multiple angles and by multiple people. So trying to funnel and have kind of one or, or a couple different kinds of points of entry for students and partners to connect, I think is, is a challenge to doing this work at a place like U of M where there's there are just so many people. And I think for graduate students who are trying to be that kind of connector or, or place to create some synergy between units on campus so that students don't feel lost and that community partners aren't, you know, an individual student isn't going back to the same partner or multiple students aren't going to the same partner asking for very similar, similar things in the same semester, things like that. Yeah, I, I love this, um, this segue because I was just about to ask you all to talk about um, helping faculty and students um, create community partnerships and sustain community partnerships. And maybe Joe, we can stay with you since you, you sort of started this, that can, can you speak a little bit to how um, you build these sustainable partnerships? And I'm thinking here of anything, you, you mentioned the Ginsburg Center, right? Other structures on campus that sort of help with that work, um, but anything from funding lines to ethic training mm -hmm. um, to support staff that are specifically helping build um, community engaged partnerships. Yeah, I would say um, from, from our program's perspective, like one of the ways we do that in creating sustainable partnerships is, is through the program itself, since graduate students, they're around campus for a few years, but but as you know, we'll, we'll go on to other places. So the program, both the Ginsburg Center and, and the program in public scholarship tend to kind of be the, the connector to create those partnerships. So what we hope to, to train students with is the ability to, to then go off in their future careers and create kind of ethical, um, you know, sustainable partnerships on their on their own campuses. And so we have a session during EPI where we bring some of our longstanding community partners that have worked with faculty on campus before, that have worked with graduate students and others on campus to a session where they kind of talk about the challenges and, and ethical dilemmas they face when working with students and, and faculty on campus. So I think that's, 
in terms of our program's goal of kind of training future faculty, we try and get students to talk with with actual community partners before they kind of go about the work of setting up a course so they know what what some of the challenges and pitfalls might be so that when they're, you know, hopefully faculty or, or in other kinds of careers too, like trying to set up partnerships, they kind of have a sense of how to go about that. So they're not doing that while trying to develop a syllabus. And, and I think the program um, helps them kind of see, see holistically the different both the amount of labor that's involved in creating these kinds of courses um, so that they can then go out and do it in a more effective way in the future, hopefully. Um, yeah, that's that's one of the ways. And then we support, I think, Rackham is very fortunate to have funding for students to, to teach these courses. And Ginsburg then has funds that can go to some of the partner organizations. So that that helps support both the students and the partners in a, in a financial sense, or it's not a huge sum, but it gives them a little bit of incentive and, and reward for their their partnerships. Um, I, I just wanted to address maybe the, there's a question in the chat um, that might be part of this, this wider question um, that, uh, you know, part of the way to, to have this sustained is to um, build it into tenure and promotion guidelines. So we did um, have a long initiative at UMBC that, that worked through the fact faculty Senate to actually change our PNT guidelines to specifically include community engaged work, um, which passed a couple of years ago. So um, that really does help sustain it. Um, we also have built into um, some like the, the public humanities minor has built into it a progression for the students so they might do a, a first course or an internship with a group and then they're they're encouraged to go back to the same group so so that um, that's built into the structure of doing a minor is that you would work with the same community group over time. Um, so that sustains partnerships. And then the last thing that you mentioned just now, um, that that we pay them, <laughs> that we don't, um, we, we've learned from many of our community partners that, um, you know, they don't, supervising our students, working with faculty on courses, having people come in is not, uh, you know, it takes an enormous amount of work and a, an enormous amount of time. And so we, we, um, try to compensate faculty, uh, uh, sorry, community group members, workers who um, work with our students or who come into our classes and, and work with them. Yeah, um, for us, I think, you know, it, it's, it's quite similar, actually. Yeah, the support that we offer uh, is both financial and logistical. Um, so, you know, like Joe and Jessica, we also, uh, we pay our faculty for their, for, with course development grants. We also um, have sort of additional funds available for things like, as I mentioned, for field trips and things like that, um, for inviting speakers. Uh, and I think a key thing that we also offer in, in the capacity that we are a smaller school and are able to do this, um, our assistant director is amazing at logistical details uh, and, you know, a faculty member, one thing that we found ourselves able to do, which I think has been really key for our faculty, is to take the burden of figuring out how to do a field trip, for example, because that can take so much time and, and often can actually deter a faculty member from doing that kind of work. And so someone says, oh, well, I'd really like to take my students out to you know, this historically black uh, island off the coast of Maine, but I have no idea how to do this. And our assistant director can say, oh, I know who to contact for these several things or who to rent a bus from. And I think, again, for our size and our rural location, that kind of, of support is, is key for our faculty who otherwise often wouldn't do these things um, because of the amount of work that it would entail for them. Uh, I also mentioned before, I think we, you know, we do serve as a node for a number of programs on campus. Uh, you know, we connect our students with the Office of Civic Engagement or with the Colby Museum. We also have a, a, a slightly more public facing arts office, which deals directly with the community um, and more. 
we connect our students to um, the community partners that we have through internships as well. Uh, we have some, because we don't offer summer courses, our students, uh, the, the center now pays for internships for these students, um, which I think is has also been really effective in showing students that there, there are possible jobs in the arts and the humanities um, to give them real life, real world experience as well in the arts and the humanities, I think has really been eye-opening and life-changing for a lot of students who emerge from that program thinking, oh, maybe I actually do want to go into uh, sort of film and event planning or, it, you know, working in the arts through a public library or working at a museum as a docent or more um, as a curator. Uh, and last thing I think I'll say is that there's something that is really key about the work that we do that I think is having a bit of a bird's eye view of what's going on on campus. So, you know, with faculty approaching us to say, well, I'm interested in doing this kind of field trip or I'm interested in working on this kind of public facing project with this kind of organization, but I don't know who that who that might be or I, I've made these inroads with this one one group and we can say, yes, we work with that group and we can connect you. We can connect you with other faculty members who have worked with that group in the past as well. Um, you know, and, and we can offer them even more ideas on how things have worked in the past for us. So I think taking the, offering our faculty the time back has been really important that saves them from the labor of looking something up to figure out how to carry something out. That's really excellent. Um, I I want to transition us to thinking a little bit about the content of these courses. Um, and over the last several years, right, each of each of you have grown these initiatives. Um, we we've also faced during that time some extraordinary social challenges, right? A global pandemic, a polarized and divided electorate um, during the Trump presidency, environmental disaster, right? The protests of summer 2020. Um, and these public humanities projects are seeking to address these pressing issues, um, and they've increased exponentially, as you've seen on your campuses and across higher ed. Um, and, you know, faculty and students are really called um, to, to do this work. Um, and I'm wondering if each of you could speak to how your initiatives um, have thought about um, in the Engaged Humanities um, courses as a venue to, to sort of speak to this moment and to engage these topics. I guess I can jump in just quickly to say that, that I think, as I mentioned briefly in my, my initial remarks, like a lot, the program really started because there was a contingency of of graduate students on campus that that felt like they wanted to teach, um, you know, really socially relevant courses and and courses where they could connect with communities, but didn't really have the the tools to do that. So I think the program itself is really a response to students both farther back, but also in more recent times, um, really wanting to to learn how to teach those kinds of courses effectively because they weren't necessarily getting that in their home departments, or, or you know, there was maybe one faculty member, but they really wanted that that larger kind of learning community aspect. And I think that's what the Engaged Pedagogy Program has, has been able to provide. So we, you know, really attract and, and see in the applicant pool, you know, students who are really committed to social justice causes and want to do, address those through their teaching, both, you know, being able to help a partner organization working on climate change or in Detroit or, or you know, disability rights and, and advocacy, you know, through the courses and the, and the, you know, engagement that students can provide to help on those issues, you know, learning by by doing, but also wanting to then teach their students about, about those topics and hopefully instill in them a sense of, you know, urgency and, and tools to address challenges in their future, future careers and, and lives too. Yeah, and I, I would just um, piggyback on that in, on our campus there, you know, this, initiative comes from faculty before it comes from students just because of we don't have as many grad students but um you know faculty in um gender women's and sexuality studies faculty in american studies faculty in um our um modern languages linguistics and intercultural communication department faculty in english you know all um 
a lot of the faculty were, were wanting to use this to find ways to do that kind of um, engagement with communities, anti-racist work, um, work towards equity of, all, of a lot of kinds. So um, I think it's, it's the two are interconnected, at least they have been on our campus and they emerge out of that group of really engaged faculty. Um, I also think that, you know, there, uh, we've, we've sort of thought about um, inclusion and community engagement as paired um, ideas all, all the way through the, inclu the inclusion imperative program. Um, but certainly in, in the last couple of years, the need has been much more explicit. And, um, you know, we've done our best to kind of rise to that occasion to, to push forward one more step. Um, we uh, hosted a series of drop-in sessions for faculty in the, the summer and fall of 2020 um, on uh, anti-racism in action, our roles now. And um, there were many topics covered in the, we, we pulled together as many experts as we could and different faculty who were doing different things and grad students. And out of that, we um, now have a, a region-wide faculty working group um, that's called anti-racism in action, and um, they continue to work. They're they're going to be co-hosting uh, the symposium that's happening in the spring. So that faculty working group on anti-racism in action is hosting a symposium on public humanities. So you can see how how the two are going to feed each other. I really like the regional approach that UMBC takes to this work. I think it's a really strong way of sort of leveraging the energies of the of the area to these these topics, it's hard work sometimes yes. to work out yes. to 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 step outside the the comfortable circle of where you can count on people and you know people, but it's very rewarding. Yeah, um, yeah, this is great. I uh, I'll try to keep my remarks brief on this. I think that, um, it, but I would absolutely echo what Jessica said where. I, you know, this absolutely comes from the faculty uh, and I see our work as helping to support the faculty driven response uh, to sort of the difficulties of the present. Um, and that that's including the sort of historical work that some of the departments and some of the departments in our college do like in African American studies or women's gender and sexuality studies um, or Latin American studies. But uh, for example, we had uh, uh, we we offer an annual humanities theme every year, and this year the theme was on freedom and captivity, uh, which was a, a really amazing theme on abolition and carcerality, uh, sponsored by uh, Chandra Bimmel in African American Studies and Anthropology, another Catherine Bestemann in Anthropology, and Gwen Shanks in Theater and Dance. So we had a number of faculty from different departments kind of come together. Um, to think through carcerality and abolition on, on campus. Um, there was work done as well within the main prison system. One of the co-sponsors taught uh, an inside out course uh, on document documentary. Um, we also have a, a growing critical race collaborative uh, that initially emerged from a seed grant from the New England Humanities Consortium um, that sort of figuring out its its next steps on the basis of sort of the current moment. Um, and then I mentioned before the Public Humanities Inquiry Lab on the intersection of race and medicine, which again, emerges from the work that our faculty are already doing that we've been sort of lucky enough and, and, and compelled to, to support as well. Um, and I'm just super excited by seeing what our faculty are doing um, to respond to and sort of challenge the feeling of stasis or um, frustration of, of everything going on. So I want to transition us to some of the questions in our Q&A. And please, um, for the audience uh, listening in and watching, um, please use this time to, to sort of populate the Q&A. Um, and I'll try my best to sort of combine similar questions and get to as many as we can. Um, but we have a few already that have come in. Um, and the first one is about um, resistance from faculty um, who might feel like publicly engaged scholarship endangers traditional disciplinary 
um, lines. Um, and have you have any of you experienced this at your home institutions? Um, and if you have, um, how have you attempted to address these concerns? Um, I, I'm sure there are such concerns, um, but I don't, they don't come at me, you know, <laughs> some people have mostly kept them to themselves, but I, um, we have worked really hard to have a definition of public humanities that is expansive. So it isn't just gender, women's and sexuality studies and American studies, which were the, the sort of two driving programs. Um, who were already doing a lot of the, we, you know, we're trying to make sure that um, people working in poetry are, are welcomed into this, people working in philosophy are welcomed into this. And I think um, helping to develop some examples of projects and ways that um, people could do this work even from disciplines that don't immediately lend themselves to it might be a way to address that question. Yeah, an extension of, of this um, in a question that we just got in the chat is um, what you're saying, Jessica, about sort of disciplines that might not immediately lend themselves to publicly engaged scholarship, right? Or what advice you might have for folks working in, say, British Renaissance literature about how to engage the, the current moment um, through public scholarship. I mean, I'll give an example. Uh, we have a historian on our campus who's mostly a historian of the, the um, Civil War, but she has done a project on early Baltimore and there's a, um, there's a mapping project. So they've investigated uh, you know, where African-Americans lived in Baltimore in, in early periods of the city. And the students are involved in that mapping project. They're going out, they're seeing the streets, they're reimagining Baltimore. So um, it's not what you would call like a political project in a for sort of explicit activist kind of way, but of course it certainly addresses um, our moment and ask students to reimagine how they consider the development of the history of Baltimore. Yeah, I think for us, um, some of the things I think about in response to that question are, you know, when we'll have faculty members, and, and I myself have struggled with this sometimes where I'm a scholar of contemporary Spain. And so I think, well, how am I going to connect what I do to rural Maine at all, right? That's sort of location-based work. Um, but I, I had a colleague who, well, I mean, well, I've done a Wikipedia project, for example, um, in sort of transforming, I hope, the, like the representation of queer Spain, for example, I, I, on Wikipedia in English and in Spanish. Um, and I got that, you know, in part through a grant through the Center for Arts and Humanities before I was the director. Um, I, have, I have a colleague who uh, was teaching on the Afro Americas uh, and in Spanish, and uh, and he's the colleague I mentioned that took us took his students to a field trip to a historically black island off the coast of Maine, and they sort of did kind of an uh, sort of ethnographic archaeological sort of walk around there um, and thinking about the history of the place and thinking about how that history has mirrored uh, what has happened throughout Latin America and, uh, and the Caribbean and the U.S. as well. And so I think there are these sort of spaces to imagine uh, how you can connect both to the present moment and to your location. Uh, and But I think it does take a sort of logistical help sometimes and it takes some someone or some institution or center sort of backing you up with that and saying here's the ways that we can make that available or more readily available or easier for you. That's a great segue um, to the next question I wanted to address which is about um, if there's institutional willingness to move towards public humanities, but you have nothing yet set up on your campus, right? Where, where do you start? What are some of the things um, that might be gateways um, to building up this infrastructure? I think it definitely depends on the, the size of your institution, obviously, and what other kinds of resources there, there might be, but even, even pretty small places tend to have some kind of 
either service learning center or, or an engagement unit, even if it's only one staff member. And I guess I, if you're really at kind of a really initial starting point, um, reaching out to someone at, at that unit on campus, they're often, you know, part of their mission is often to create partnerships both off campus and on campus and do some of the matchmaking work to, to find opportunities based on community identified needs. So I would seek out that that office and do some research or maybe it's within another college at your institution. Um, you might need to start with with a different discipline to kind of arrive back at back at the humanities and oftentimes they're they're really excited to get more humanists and those kinds of, of skill sets. Um, partners need good writers and 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 things like that too. So that's that's my go to kind of starting point, at least at least initially. Um, and I'll, I'll, I want to second that our, our, on our campus, the Shriver Center has been a great partner and they, they were doing this work sort of qu more quietly before um, we were. So, yeah. Um, I just wanted to add an addendum to this question that that might further um, the conversation. Just if you've been able to support any of the faculty in extending some of these projects into sort of longer term. Um, projects um, as opposed to just course length partnerships. Um, so, I mean, we certainly have, and, and we've got a lot of faculty, we, we're trying to encourage faculty to go back to the same groups instead of to just continually sort of say, well, what other group, what other group, or um, to develop skill sets that they can use over time with different cohorts of students. Um, but, uh, you know, one, one thing I, I want to say about this is that um, if, you, if you can pull together a group of like-minded faculty and then, you know, reach out to your internship center or whatever, wherever the likely place is that might have logistical support, because I, I love that point that that's really important. Um, then you know there you can share. I, I think what happens is that you realize that other people have expertise, and that they have connections, and that you know if you can get a group of like-minded faculty or grad students or a combination working together, um, you'd be amazed at how much would come out of that, even without like a center behind you or a program. Yeah, I would also add that if you have a, a museum on your campus of any size or kind, they can often be good connectors and are looking a good starting point for either a faculty member or a student to, to do like programming for, for local schools or something like that. Um, and, and to the last question, we're really situated as a program that's more about the infrastructure of, of supporting engaged, engaged learning for graduate students. but. Um, we often work with the same partners. So, you know, students, we might help a graduate student teach a course with an organization, but the reason we are able to connect the student with that org is because they were also a, a host site for our internship program, which I think Dean, you mentioned that that's kind of a synergy between things. So trying to do things like that from an institutional perspective can also be helpful, even if it's not the same faculty member that's, that's going back to the org, there's at least some unit or connection on campus. Yeah, and I was just going to say probably something quite similar to what Jessica and Joe both said, but it, that it's, you know, uh, there is likely someone doing that work on campus in some capacity, whether or not it's a center or an institution, the muse museums, a college or university museums often have all sorts of different types of outreach to the public. Um, if there's the Office of Civic Engagement or a Career Services Office as well, they will know local partners. Um, but if if that were not to be the case, then there's always take a take a look around the local community. Who are the artists? What are the art institutions? What are the sort of humanities centered institutions? And they're always looking for support and help and engagement in some way. Uh, and I think just reaching out to those people is a way to to get a foot in the door or to think about how your course or your uh, department or whatever it is might engage with them uh, and not on just a one off sort of thing, but uh, in a series. Yeah, and just from my sort of bird's eye view on the field over at Humanities for All, I've, it seems like 
you know, we've talked about this early on in the session that small pots of money really go a long way early on, the sort of seed grant model. Um, if it's $500, you know, like what you can do a lot with $500 at a, at a humanistic level, right? So as a starting point for faculty or for students to sort of get into, into the mode of doing this work, um, it's a really great um, starting point. But, and on that vein, we, we have a question about sort of how much financial support really moves this work forward. Um, how did you come to the numbers that you came to in order to, to give money to community partners, right? What did, what does 4,000 look like for faculty versus the number for community partners? I'm trying to remember how we came up with the with the numbers, but I think um, certainly like the the, the um, four thousand number looks like some of the other summer stipend mon amounts that we give people to develop new courses, or you know, so the the, the amount we gave faculty represents like time over at the summer or something to to develop what they need to develop. Um, what we give um, uh, community partners has to do with, you know, amount of time, like if, if they are coming into one course session, they might get 150 or $200 for that course session, right? Um, if we are asking them to do more supervisory roles, they would um, have, a, you know, a longer engagement, right? Which, so we might, we might do it by time. Um, but we also often find ways to, um, uh, to provide work for, you know, sometimes you can do a reciprocal exchange where the students would build a website for a community group and they would feel that that they had benefited, right? That it would, doesn't always need to be an honorarium, I think, um, because that is a very complicated thing at, at many institutions to provide for outside groups. Yeah, I also, I don't have a, um, a great answer for this. Um, there's a sort of, uh, there's a bit of a college sort of, not even a level of policy, just habit of offering certain amounts, for example, to, to faculty for course development grants. And so that's the kind of money that we offer for our um, course development grants, which are about 3000. Um, and uh, in addition to sometimes uh, offering some support for like the logistical support or the um, additional support um, for our for our community partners, uh, one of the key needs I think that we saw was that a community partner couldn't necessarily offer a paid internship over the summer. Um, so that was one of the things that our center was able to take on and to say, okay, we can, we could fund X amount of paid internships for our students, because it was really important to us that our students in the arts and humanities had the same types of experiences available to them as, uh, as their, their classmates in the social sciences or the heart, the natural sciences. And so um, we were able to sort of start from there and say, okay, here's what we would pay our students. And this is what we will cover an internship with your, with your, you know, with the main film center or the public library or the natural uh, history museum, for example. So we've reached the end of our hour together. That Q&A really flew by. Thank you so much for um, all of your questions. And there's many that we didn't get to that I will um, flag for our panelists after this. Um, but I just wanna thank our panelists today for generously donating their time and expertise. Um, and our next webinar will be on scaling up public humanities projects um, joined by both um, humanities faculty and their community partners. Um, and um, that will be on January 27th at 1 p.m. Um, we also just recently launched um, a public humanities newsletter um, via Humanities for All Substack, um, which we would love for you to subscribe to. It's sort of like public humanities news from across the web, across the nation, um, job ads, fellowships, um, you know, webinars, institutes. Um, so I'd encourage you to subscribe if you're interested in receiving that information. But if you have any additional questions for our panelists, 
I'm sure they'd love to hear from you. Um, but in the meantime, I hope you all enjoyed this conversation and we hope to see you all soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.